I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter one. This book needs no introduction other than it being read. I'm gonna read the first three verses which will be our text for this morning. Follow along with me in your copy of God's word. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his slaves the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his slave, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. What is this book? As we said last week, this is a pastoral letter that is a letter written by a pastor to people that he was a shepherd over. And this is a pastoral letter narrating future history. You can read the book of Revelation like a history book, except that the events described in it have not yet happened. And yet they are as certain as if they had already happened. The title of this book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It comes from the first words of the book. The first word in Greek is the word apocalypse. This is the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. This is a revealing rather than a concealing work. The word apocalypse is a compound word. Uh, the main idea of the word, the main root of the word was a covering and the front end of it means to take away. It means to remove a covering. That which was hidden becomes hidden no longer. What is contained in this book is not designed by God to be hidden and as designed by God, it is not human. This book is not from around here. The word apocalypse as a noun shows up 18 times and as a verb shows up 26 times in the Bible and it is always God who does the revealing, the uncovering. And it is God's intention in this book to show, to communicate. This says something about the perspicuity or the clarity of our Bibles. This is perhaps the most difficult book, the most enigmatic book in our Bibles, and yet at the very front end, it is called The Revealing. That is, God's design in this book is to make things known, not to hide them or shroud them in mysteries. Now, much ink has been spilled over what kind of revealing is this. The first words are the revealing of Jesus Christ. Does this mean that this is a book that reveals things about Jesus? Is this a book that reveals Jesus himself? Or is this a book that Jesus does some revealing in? Is Jesus revealing the future? Or is Jesus the one revealed? And of course, both of those things are true in this book. Jesus will tell us things about the future. Only one of these things can be intended by the author. Both happen to be true, only one's intended in this verse. I take this introduction to indicate that the book's great theme is the revealing of Jesus Christ. That is the unveiling of Jesus the Messiah. Jesus is the great subject of this book. And I think it can be seen throughout this book that Jesus' unveiling is at the very heart of everything that is done here. In chapter one, we see the glorious vision of Christ that John got to see while he was on the island of Patmos, that place where the, the cloak is sort of pulled back. Someone like John and James and Peter when they encountered Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, where his enfleshment was peeled back and his brilliant, radiating, sunbright glory blazed forth. And Peter said, it's good to be here. John gets a vision of Christ like that in chapter one. And you remember John the apostle was the one who was so comfortable with the man Jesus at the Last Supper that he leaned against him at the table. Uh, they didn't have chairs at the table, they were sort of reclining on the floor and, and John was in Jesus' bosom as it were, 
leaning and reclining against him comfortably. This same John and this same Jesus show up in Revelation chapter one and John is no longer comfortable. He falls down as a dead man before the glorified Christ. Jesus is unveiled glory, gloriously in chapter one. He is incognito no more. The lamb slain is also the lion of Judah. In one of our Christmas hymns, we sing, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Revelation gives us the unveiling. (laughs) No more hiding behind mere humanity. Oh yes, Jesus will always be the God-man. The the theanthropic union, that is God and humanity in one person. He will be that forever and ever. But we see his glory on display in the book of Revelation. Revelation. Do you remember those early followers of Jesus who said, sir, we would see Jesus. In the book of Revelation, we will see him indeed. Jesus did not become this glorious being after the ascension. As if Jesus started in Bethlehem and he went from baby to boy to man to Messiah. No, Jesus was from of old from eternity past. In fact, in John 17, five, you remember that Jesus said to the Father in the prayer as he prayed before the disciples on that last night before he was betrayed, he said, Father, let me have the glory that I had with you before the world began. And the glory we see of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation is the glory he has always had. And it was the glory that was concealed in his humiliation, in his incarnation, in his time on earth. And frankly, that's the Jesus we think of most, is it not? Sweet, gentle Jesus on the earth, humble, a man, the baby in a manger. The revelation of Jesus Christ means that in this book, we will see Jesus as he truly is. In chapter one, Jesus is revealed as exalted, terrifying, and comforting simultaneously. In the chapters two and three, we see Jesus as sovereign Lord of his churches on the earth. He is present and amidst his churches to assess, to comfort, to reassure, to convict, even to remove. In chapters four and five, we see Jesus at the center of concentric circles of heavenly worship. At the throne of his father, surrounded by four living creatures and the 24 elders and myriads and myriads of angels and the uncountable number of the redeemed. And he is at the center of all of that worship. We find in chapter five, Jesus is the only rightful claimant to the earth. And he is the only one worthy to advance God's program of judgment against earth dwellers. And that judgment unfolds in chapter six through 18, where we see Jesus is the one who unleashes divine retribution on the earth from heaven in a series of judgments, those seal judgments which telescope out into trumpet judgments which telescope out into bowl judgments. Turn to Revelation 6 and verse 16. The earth dwellers, that's Revelation's name for the unrepentant people who are still on the earth during the tribulation. They said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the, notice this, wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand. Jesus is revealed as the judge of the earth. In chapter 14, Jesus is revealed as the judge over all of eternity. Look at Revelation 14, 10. This is a striking verse. It's been lurking in your Bible all the time. In verse nine, an angel describing those who take the mark of the beast are headed for conscious eternal torment in the lake of fire. And then he describes what happens there, verse 10. They will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and they will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Do you understand that the omnipresence of Jesus means he is present in hell forever and ever as the rightful judge of all those who reject him? 
Jesus will be revealed. Then, of course, in chapter 19, you have Jesus revealed in his glorious return to the earth where he will eliminate the world's armies armies in a single stroke at the Battle of Armageddon. Every eye will see him when he comes like lightning that flashes across the dark night sky. There will be no mistake. Nobody hiding in some far off country saying, oh, I'm the Messiah, I'm over here in some news report you read somewhere. No, everyone will know Jesus is back. Revelation 19 reveals that Jesus of Nazareth is the sovereign king of all kings and he is the Lord of all lords. He will have his robe drenched in the blood of his enemies. He will bring the age of rebellious human society to an absolute end and he will usher all believers into his glorious, prosperous, peaceful, faithful, universal, and eternal kingdom. And then in chapter 20, you see that thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth as king. Second half of Revelation 20, he's revealed as the great judge of all mankind at that great white throne judgment. He is also seen as the defeater of death. There at the end of Revelation 20, death dies. And Jesus ushers God's people in Revelation 21 and 22 into the eternal state, a new heavens and new earth where there is no more curse, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more mourning, no more death because the first first things go away. And Jesus, the Messiah, seals all of this with his own identity, saying, I am the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, and I testify that these things are true. The revelation of Jesus the Christ is the revealing of Jesus. That's what this book is about. We know that Jesus goes from being humiliated to being vindicated and victorious. I want to give you this morning three foundations that are critical for understanding this book. They, they flow out of the first three verses here, three foundations, foundational understandings that we must have if we're going to grapple with this book. And the first is found in verse one. It is simply this, God gave the revelation. God gave the revelation. Looking down at your Bibles, in verse one, we find the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, that is, God gave Jesus, to show to Jesus' slaves the things which must soon take place. And Jesus sent and communicated it by his angel to his slave John. God gave to Christ the revelation. We need to understand, first of all, that revelation begins with God. God is the only one who can tell the future because he is the one who predetermined the future. The future of the world is his story. It is future history. And we see that God gave the the opportunity for Messiah to be revealed in this way. He gave it to Jesus. This is interesting. Uh, The Son always does what pleases the Father. There is a subordination of relationships between the Trinitarian persons, although in a quality of being. The Son follows what the Father says and does, and here it pleases the Father for His beloved Son to be revealed. You remember other ways it pleased the Father, the Son's activities. The Son was pleasing to the Father when He was immersed in filthy water with sinners at His baptism. You remember at the transfiguration, it pleased the Father for Jesus to be uncloaked for a few brief moments to Peter, James, and John. You remember from Isaiah 53 that it pleased the Father that the Son would be crushed under the weight of sin, where God would pour out His righteous judgment against everyone who would ever believe, except not on us, but on Christ instead as a substitute. That pleased the Father. And here it pleases the Father for the beloved Son to be revealed for all that He is, to be seen as He truly is. God gives to Christ this unveiling. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2. This is not something new, this is not a plan B of God's ordination of historical events. This is what God has ordained for the Son. Philippians 2.5 describes this, telling us Christians to be humble like Jesus and then describes his humility. Verse six, Jesus, because he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, 
being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Here the book of Revelation details for us the manifest beginnings of this revealing of Messiah in glory. Why? Why did God give Jesus the revealing of Jesus? To show his slaves, verse one. God wanted Jesus to show to his own slaves what's coming. God had us in mind in this. God saw fit according to his purpose that we would get a glimpse of the glorified Christ and that we would get a glimpse of the events that come with his glorifying himself in salvation and in judgment. Why would God want us to know what will happen? Why do we get this prerogative? Why do we get this privilege? Why do we get this inside knowledge? Well, the book of Revelation was given by God through Jesus to John, to us, particularly for the stated purposes of bringing comfort and encouragement to persecuted churches. We'll get to that as chapter one, two, and three unfold, and then it's a refrain in chapter 22. The purpose of this revelation is to bring encouragement. And friends, look, to know how the story ends is a huge help in the midst of trials. It's a tremendous encouragement when when this fledgling little body of believers clinging to Jesus in the midst of a hostile and dark world around us, it's good to know that Jesus is vindicated and that all those who attach themselves to him will also be glorified with him. That's a comfort. We're nobodies. (laughs) And in the eyes of the world, Christians are often less than nobodies. Most of us have not lived under severe persecution where our lives are at stake, property is plundered, loved ones taken away. Those days may come. They certainly have come for many throughout church history and even many Christians in our world today. It's a comfort when under pressure to know how this all goes down. God wants those who are loyal to him to know his plans. That's a great inside privilege. He's our father and he's letting us in. This is a great help to weak, vulnerable, persecuted, marginalized followers of Jesus. And he calls us slaves. And if you're a Christian and a slave of Christ, you already know what good news that is. If you're not a follower of Christ, you may recoil at the idea of slavery. That word has a bad name and a bad history. (laughs) The truth is, there are none truly free. Friends, you are either a slave of sin under a slave master who wants to destroy you and lead you to eternal destruction, or you are a slave of God, a slave of Christ, a slave of righteousness under the banner of grace, under the banner of love, affectionately cared for by a father. And the idea of slavery to Christ is so good. There may have been a day where you said, I'm no one slave. John 8, Jesus said, if you're a sinner, you're a slave of sin, bottom line. Romans 6 makes it clear. You are slaves of sin when you were apart from Christ. You thought you were free. It felt free, but you also know that everything you pursued was a dead end leading to destruction. And God graciously brought you under the reign of grace and made you a slave of Christ. Throughout biblical history, God's people have been affectionately called his slaves. Abraham, Jacob, Caleb and Joshua, David, Elijah, Job, Isaiah, the prophets collectively, 
They were all called slaves of God explicitly in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, the apostles were also called slaves. Men like Epaphras, choice servants called slaves of Christ. And in the end, all Christians. Our identity as slaves of Christ. Listen, you're in good company as a slave of Christ. And this is high privilege. This is high privilege. It's an honor. To be God's slave is to be rescued, to be protected, to be provided for. Listen, what slave master was there ever who laid down his life, called his slaves his people, and even his friends and sons and daughters, and gave them all that belonged to him? This is a good slavery. And God gave Jesus the revelation so that Jesus could show his slaves, notice verse one, the things which must soon take place. The things that must happen. What's in view here are events. Historical realities. Happenings, people, places, judgments, battles. These are not just general esoteric ideas. And these things must happen. That means that history is not random. These things must take place. And when will they take place? Verse one tells us, soon, soon. What does that mean? It means there's nothing in between this declaration and the prophetic events described at the return of Christ that have to take place in the intervening period. What do we learn from the book of Acts? The intervening period is, you don't get to know the times, you don't get to know the epics, go preach the gospel. What do we do? We we don't bring in the kingdom, but we populate it. (laughs) If we talk about kingdom work, what we mean as Christians is, preach the gospel and purchase with your efforts citizenship in the kingdom that is coming. But we don't know when it's coming. But there's nothing that has to happen prior to its arrival, which is different than other prophetic portions of the Bible. Daniel 8.17 says, Daniel, this vision pertains to the time of the end, which means there were a lot of other prophetic things that Daniel got that happened in the intervening time. In fact, Daniel 2.45, uh, the, the angel tells Daniel, this is for the future, or literally for the afterwards. From Daniel's perspective, writing before the first coming of Christ, writing about the second coming of Christ, what had to happen between Daniel's prophetic vision and the second coming of Christ? Well, all those wars and empires that had to rise and fall, and then the first coming of Christ. But for us, there aren't those intervening prophetic periods. The events associated with the return of Christ are next That is, they are soon, they are imminent. And you might think, well, 2,000 years has gone by. (laughs) That doesn't sound like soon to me. And there is a prophetic compression of time that happens throughout Scripture. By the way, that's a matter of mercy. Do you remember Noah, preacher of righteousness? Do you remember how long his, if you're thinking about how long, we're only in point one, how long is this sermon gonna go? Noah's went for 100 years. And he's telling people, get on the boat. That is a mercy of the Lord. God was angry about sin in the world at that first global cataclysm. And he waited. 2,000 years have gone by. We're here. You're here right now hearing God's word. You've heard the gospel. You've sung it. What a kind mercy of the Lord not to have ended the world or ended your life already. And it's still soon. How does this word soon stir you? Do you wake up in the morning? Soon. Could it be today? This word is intended by God to have an effect. We'll come back to that. The second foundation we need to have to understand this book, not only did God give the revelation, but Jesus transmitted the revelation. We find this in the second half of verse one and then all of verse two. And Jesus sent and communicated it. Uh, Literally, this is uh, Jesus indicated it, sending his angel, 
And this word for indicated here means to signify or cause something to be understood, cause something to be clear. He transmitted this revelation to his slaves. By what vehicle? According to verse one, by sending it through his angel. Now, angels are prominent in the book of Revelation. They have a pronounced role in this book. God uses angels. He uses angelic beings to accomplish his purposes. He has done that throughout biblical history. We were introduced to a, to a cherubim with a flaming sword guarding the tree of life at the entrance of the Garden of Eden when man sinned, and God said, you have to go away. You can't have access to eternal life anymore being a sinner. And all throughout biblical history, God has used angels. The book of Hebrews tells us that angels are sent out as ministering spirits to serve the elect. And we don't know where they are. We can identify them. We, we don't know when and where we have entertained angels. But God uses these supernatural beings as agents of his ordination. That is, he sends them out to serve his purposes. And God could do whatever he wants without angels but he employs these supernatural beings for his purposes in part to serve us. And they show up all over the book of Revelation. 67 times in the book of Revelation, angels are referred to. That is a quarter of all the references in your whole Bible. In fact, turn to Revelation 22. We have perhaps the the closing reference to Jesus' angel here, or God's angel. Uh, perhaps the one that was the vehicle for transmitting Jesus' revelation to John. We read in Revelation 22, 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. (laughs) I am a fellow slave of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. It's not the first time in this book that John is tempted to worship an angelic being, which means these beings are so magnificent, so terrifying, so radiant, that the likes of us would be tempted to bow down before them. And yet, what are they in God's economy? Slaves. Slaves with us. Slaves of God and of Christ. And in this case, a a servant of God to be a part of the communication of this revelation. So one angel in particular had the task of conveying these things to John. God provided this angel to be the mechanism for showing John the revelation. I don't know what that means. Um, Did the angel carry around a projector and a screen? John, watch this. Did he carry him away into prophetic trance and vision? What we have in the book of Revelation is a series of scenes that the angel shows John, and then John records. Notice the five-part chain of communication. God gave it to Christ, who communicated it via via his angel, to John the apostle, who had communicated it to Jesus' loyal followers. Why is there this five-part chain of communication? Uh, Perhaps to stress the importance of the message, But I think also this grants us the assurance that this revelation did not come from John. He's not a crazy guy in solitary confinement with a few screws loose. He's not on drugs. He didn't eat some weird mushrooms. He's not an inventive, creative, artistic madman making things up out of his own head. This came from God through Christ, through the angel, to John, to us. And then we find out about this, John. He he bore witness He bore witness. This is a a, a solemn word. It means to testify, to give solemn testimony, like a witness in a law court or being compelled under oath to speak only the truth in a legal deposition. And John here is to testify to two things, to the word of God and to the witness of Jesus Christ. For John to solemnly bear witness to the word of God means that this book is God's very breathed out word. Like the rest of your Bible, it is God's own word. And John is compelled to give solemn testimony to that fact. Therefore, the book of Revelation is like the rest of the Bible, without error, it is authoritative, it is clear, it is necessary, and it is sufficient. And then John gives solemn testimony to the testimony or the witness of Jesus Christ. 
That is, John gives unadulterated witness to all that Jesus communicated. Whatever Jesus said, John said. Whatever Jesus testified to, John recorded. He did not tamper, he did not meddle with it, he did not alter the message. And listen, being a prophet is serious business. Do you remember what the Bible says about prophets who spoke not from the Lord? They were to be taken outside the town and thrown rocks at until they stopped breathing. You're not allowed to say, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord thus not saith. That ought to strike terror into all of us when we would claim to speak for God. Being a prophet was very serious business. This led to the conclusion of the book, Revelation 22, verse 18. I testify, again, that same solemn testimony word there, to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life, from the holy city, which are written in this book. You don't meddle. So this five-part chain of communication with all of its solemnity, sobriety, heavenly-mindedness, this is serious business. And John gives testimony, speaking only the truth of what he saw and heard. Notice the last little phrase in verse two, even to all that he saw. It's a really important clue about how the book was transmitted via a vision that is, uh, the, the phrase, and I saw, or and he saw, or and you saw, happened some 50 times in the book of Revelation. That is, Revelation was conveyed visually. And that's appropriate for a book about the revealing of Jesus the Messiah, the unveiling. There's a third foundation here that is critical to understanding this book, and, and this one has to do with you and me. God gave the revelation, Jesus transmitted the revelation, but we play a part here. We attend the revelation. We attend the revelation. I was looking for one short word to sort of sum this up. We, we might think of attendance like attendance sheet at school. Yeah, I attend school. It doesn't mean you're, you're there mentally. You can be checked out and very much present. That's not what I mean by attend here. By attend, I mean give attention to, pay mind to, hearken, pay close attention to, hang on every word as if your life depends on it. That is our task with this book. And we're gonna see here a, a how shall we attend to the book of Revelation and then a why. First, let's look at the how. How shall we pay attention to this book? Verse three, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things written in it for the time is near. How shall we attend to this book? First of all, he who reads and those who hear. He who reads is singular, those who hear is plural. There is a reader and there are auditors, there are listeners, a group of listeners. What's going on here? Um, the, the singular one reading harkens back to synagogue days where the scroll was there in the synagogue and an official part of the worship service was to open the scroll and someone would read, someone with the official capacity called a reader would read the text of scripture and all those who were present for the worship service would listen attentively. By the way, if you didn't have a copy of God's word sitting on your lap, how carefully would you listen to the scriptures read? You'd pay attention. And listen, the early church did the same thing the synagogues did. There were readers. In fact, throughout much of church history, an official church position was the reader. And you must understand that books were rare. Scrolls were expensive to own. The materials on which they were made were hard to get and therefore expensive. And they all had to be hand copied. I don't know if you've ever tried to hand copy something and get it right. Now, there's an entire industry built around getting the scriptures right, hand copy after hand copy to be distributed to places where they would be taught, places where they would be read publicly, places where they would be heard. 
That's what's in view here. That's why you have uh, one singular. Blessed is the one who reads. And can you imagine the blessing? You mean, you mean I, I get to be the guy that, that actually has a copy of it? And, and I'm gonna go meditate on it for a while, and I'm gonna study it, and I'm gonna rehearse it so I read it correctly. And I'm gonna read it publicly so that those who are listening can actually have God's word. What a blessing would that be? That would be life-changing. What a great job that is. And then the hearers, listening in, gathered. You may remember the, the book Fahrenheit 451, of course, 451 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature at which paper burns. Right? That book was about book burning. And so the firemen in the story were those who collected books and set them on fire. Uh, our firemen, thankfully, do different things than that. And the idea was that, that since books were being burned, individuals would get a hold of a precious copy before it was confiscated and they would read it and read it and read it and learn it and learn it. They would memorize it and become the book and then these people would walk around in the forest. Could you imagine that? Uh, maybe a persecuted church? What would we do? Who's got Philippians memorized? Who's got Ecclesiastes memorized? Who picked Leviticus? We need you. <laughs> The reading and the listening to scripture was so critical. What a privilege it would be to read it, to hear it. This is why Paul says in 1 Timothy 4.13, give attention to the reading, that is the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. Over the last year, Omri Miles and Eric Martin read the text of Revelation to us, verse by verse on Sunday mornings for our public reading of scriptures. I don't know what you were thinking at that time. Uh, you know, the, the, the service is about something else, the sermon's about something else, the songs are about something else. And we're going from these dramatic portrayals of, of blood-soaked robes and enemies squashed to singing about Jesus. Look, that's not incongruous. These things actually go together. And I trust you were blessed in the reading and hearing of that publicly. And I hope this stirs in your heart the, the uniqueness that we have in our day, the historic privilege, frankly, of owning and reading Bibles. In the New Testament era, that was rare. The pre-Reformation era, that was rare. In the Reformation era, that was rare because it was persecuted. For much of church history, the Bible was buried by the church. And it wasn't until 1450 AD that you had technology, like the Gutenberg Press movable typeface, that allowed Bibles to be printed rather than hand copied. And that date, 1450, is interesting because it predates the Protestant Reformation. In fact, it was the printed Bibles in the hands of the con uh, common people that actually fanned the flames of the Protestant Reformation and while the institutional church had buried the Bible, people began to get a hold of it in their own languages. In many churches, a Bible was chained to the pulpit just because even then they were expensive and rare. One Scottish farmer named Murdoch Nisbet in 1520 took his Wycliffe New Testament, translated it into his home tongue, Scots, for his family and for his countrymen. He's just a farmer, Bible translator. At that time, the church made the English Bible illegal. Mere possession of a colloquial Bible in English or Picts or Scots could mean imprisonment or death. Many of the men who actually gave us our English Bibles paid for it with their own blood. Murdoch Nesbitt, this farmer, dug a secret vault under the ground on his farm so that he could translate and write out the New Testament by hand into the language of his family. When I was a kid, I read several biographies of POWs who were in the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, that is the pet name for the internment camp in North Vietnam. Pilots were shot down and kept there and tortured. You know some of their names. There was a Bible that went around the Hanoi Hilton. It was handmade. It wasn't complete. Probably had some errors in it. And, and guys had made paper out of whatever they could find, oftentimes spitting up the, the meager rations of rice they could have mixed with their own saliva to make paper. 
and then with charcoal or dirt or sometimes even their own blood and a sharp implement, writing out Bible verses they could remember. Many of these men weren't churchgoers or went to Catholic schools as a kid and they could, they could remember the Lord's Prayer because they had to memorize it. Others had significant portions of the Bible committed to memory and they, they wrote it out as best they could in this Bible in the Hanoi Hilton. And they passed it around and it was a treasure. One guy gets it at a time. <laughs> Bobby Bagley, one of those POWs, uh, reports of the, the wonderful day that he got latrine duty, which was the awful task of being forced down into a sewage pit, raw sewage, as torture. And he found there the Bible that had been confiscated by the North Vietnamese and tossed into the sewage. And like a precious treasure, he dug it out, cleaned it off as best he could, and it made its rounds around the POW camp again. Do you understand what you have on your laps? God's very word in your language. I hope you're praying for Zach Can and for the team in Papua New Guinea. Laboring, laboring, laboring to put God's word in the Doe language for tribal peoples who have never had access to it before. I'm sure I've told this story numerous times. The first day our missionaries in Papua New Guinea were there actually doing Doe language training. Tribal people from five other tribes walked into the village and handed letters to Zach and Cassidy. What are these letters? Oh, we heard that if if you wrote a, a handwritten letter that some missionary could come and put God's word in our language. And we'd like to have a missionary come put God's word in our language. Those five hand-drawn colored pencil letters are on my desk in my office. And if you want to pick one up and answer that letter and take God's word to one of those tribes, we'll send you. Now we have copies and we can read for ourselves. What are we reading here? The words of the prophecy. That that means John's book here is in the stream of Old Testament prophets. That is, this is God's direct revelation. Some have sort of written off this book in our Bibles by calling it apocalyptic. And by apocalyptic, they mean a, a, a genre of Jewish literature that was mystical, fanciful, end times fiction. Well, this book is no such thing. This is like Old Testament prophecy. It's not mystical guesses and fanatical prognostications. This is God's word directly given by revelation without error, telling the future that God has decreed. So what do we do with it? We we read and we hear the words of this prophecy and then notice verse three, and heed the things written in it. Heed. Heed. What does it mean to pay attention to this revelation, to attend it, to to pay close attention? It means to obey it. To keep it here means to take in its words, see its implications for our lives, and do what God would have us do by it. The revelation is not here in our Bibles to stimulate our curiosity, but to motivate our living. William Barclay said, to hear God's word is a privilege, to obey it is a duty. And so you can't write this book off as obscure, symbolic, apocalyptic literature. Actually, you must read it and hear it and obey it. And this, again, says something about the clarity of the Bible, the clarity of the whole Bible. If this most difficult book comes with the expectation from God that his meaning could be understood so that we are obligated to actually obey it, then that's true of the whole Bible. You can't have that expectation from a a literature which can't be comprehended. God wrote his word, even this book, in order to be understood. And of course, the mere fact that God spoke is reason enough for us that we pay attention and we heed his words. Not only is it a privilege and a duty to cling to what God has revealed, it also comes with the promise of blessing. Notice the first words of verse three. Blessed is he who reads and hears and heeds. Blessed. Overused word? Under understood? Blessed means to be made happy, 
specifically to enter into the happiness that God provides. You must understand, friend, God is not stingy. He gives good gifts. He's not a joy thief or a buzzkill. He simply knows where true joy is to be found. He is the creator. He is the one who made you, and he made you with taste buds. He made you with the capacity for joy. He made you with the ability for happiness. And when we go scurrying off away from him to try to find happiness in finite things, temporary things, or evil things, God is gracious to warn, cajole, encourage, confront, indict. Why? Because he knows that our rebellion against him is the true joy thief. So he tells us what brings true happiness. In fact, there are seven blessing statements in the book of Revelation, and here this first one is, blessed is the one who reads and those who hear and those who heed. This is a beatitude, a a well of happiness available to us. Do you remember the beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount? Look at Matthew 5. These are counter-cultural happiness recipes. They go against the lies of the world. They go against the grain of the world. Listen to them. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Does that seem strange to you, that list? You're happy. (laughs) Happy if you're poor, sad, hungry, and persecuted. And then you read the second half of those. You, you, You take the long view. It's like Psalm 73. I was miserable when I compared my life to the wicked because they get everything they want. And then I came into the house of the Lord and I saw their end. They're on slippery places that end in destruction. What do I have? Forgiveness of sin. My poverty of spirit has led me to grace and infinite riches. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah, people are gonna run all over me and trample my life. Merciful. Oh, you will be with God. You will be in his presence. You will have eternal reward. You remember Psalm 1 and the beatitude there? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the place of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is what? In the law of God. And on on his law he meditates day and night. Friends, we need God's word. Blessing comes from God's word because we're surrounded by scoffers who reject the truth, convinced that happiness is to be had without God, that happiness actually comes from slavery to sin, or your rebellious autonomy is the key to your own happiness. It never works out. It has never worked out. But you and I feel the pressure of that. We need God's word day and night so we're not conformed to the pattern of this world, squeezed into its mold. Maybe it's possible you're here this morning and you have misdefined happiness. You've become short-sighted. Happiness is getting what I think I want right around the corner. Have all those other corners panned out for you? It's not there. You gotta look up. There's a second why. The first why should we attend to the book of Revelation? Blessings. There's a second one. It's the end of the verse. For the time is near. Why must you pay attention to this book? Because the time is near. Time here is a season or period of time. It's a reference to the time of the end, the, the season of those events, of the close of human history, and it is close How can it be close if 2,000 years have gone by and it's still not here yet? Well, it's closer than it was when John wrote it. (laughs) Again, this prophetic view means it is at hand, it's imminent, it could happen at any time. There are no events in God's revealed timeline that must happen first before the events associated with Christ's second coming. So we must always be ready. It's imminent. 
The events of this book hang over human history. They loom like a shadow over all the achievements of man, over all the rebellions of humanity, over every secret thought and careless word. What is done in private has always been in full view of heaven, and the day is coming when everything will be laid bare. The nearness of the end is a great motivator to holy living. Joseph Seiss, a commentator, says it poetically. Like a magnet, it lifts the heart of the believer out of the world, out of his low self, and it enables him to stand with Moses on the mount and transfigure him with the rays of blessed hope and the promise which stream upon him in those sublime heights. It is the most animating and sanctifying subject in the Bible. It is the soul's serenest light amid the darkest trials of earth. Look, it is a blessing here to get disattached from the world that God is set to bring to ruin. Let me ask you this morning, do you have a heart that is resistant to this book in some way, for some reason? Maybe resistant to the, the whole doctrine of eschatology, the study of end times? Look, I, I know that there is silliness that has happened that has made eschatology distasteful. But that is no incentive for us to avoid God's word. We don't pick and choose what to look at from what God has revealed. This is the only book in your Bible that, is, that comes with a stated blessing for reading and hearing and heeding it. And so we can ignore the, the Millerites, the date setters, the fictionalizers, the headline sensationalism, and dig into God's word and be blessed. And we must. But you know, we can also discredit God's word with our own lives by silly living. To, to, to carry God's book around and then not heed it. Aside from eschatology, is there a section of God's word you tend to neglect? An area of God's word that might require change in you or bring conviction or, or make life uncomfortable. Friends, we cannot do that with God's word. We must sit under it, yield ourselves to it, and find our true happiness there. Again, this book was designed to give aid and comfort to persecuted churches but I think it also helps us comfortable Christians get a little less comfortable with the world. Why must Jesus' slaves know what must soon take place? I'll let Jesus answer that from a parable in Luke 12 and we'll close with this. You can listen. I'm reading from Luke 12 beginning in verse 35. Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and he knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and he will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even the third and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too, be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else? And the Lord said, who is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming, and he begins to beat the slaves, men and women, to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers." And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. The one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive few. 
From everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled, said the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, it is to you that we look. We thank you for this, your revelation. Given to your slave, John, given to us, your loyal slaves. Oh, we love you. We don't love you as we should. We believe, but oh Lord, help our unbelief. I pray that we would be gripped by this book. That it would change us, that it would change our church, that we would never be the same, that you would accomplish all that you intend for us in it. And God, we would ask that you would help us to turn our eyes to your son, the glorious, beautiful, magnificent, terrifying, awful, compassionate, wonderful, Jesus, the Messiah, in whose name we pray, amen.